Blog Talk Radio. Good morning. You've reached Venus Unplugged, a virtual heartbreak hotel. This is your host, Lorraine Nightheart. And what we do here in this virtual heartbreak hotel is all things that have to do with Venus. The good, the bad, the transformative uh, the powers. We, we explore psyche, and soul, art, and myth. And so we're working with the archetypal energies of myths and dreams and fairy tales. All stories of the soul. And what Venus Unplugged is about is to help you understand for those that want to and for those that it's their natural nature, that the internal world informs the external world. That's where we are, uh, the magicians. That is the power of Venus. Uh, Venus, not just as the goddess of love and beauty, but she is also the goddess of heaven and earth. She is the essence of all things related. She gives birth to a son, and our son is Eros, and that is the principle of all relatedness. So we always have stories and realities and tons of questions about love, the right way and the wrong way. Well, you know, it's like going to hell. The only way is we just keep walking until we see the end, okay? And this is what we're going to work with for the next couple of weeks is the story of Snow White, the fairy tale of Snow White, teaching story of uh, death and transformation and uh, helping the innocent, childlike, feminine, both in male and female, move towards consciousness. And that's what fairy tales, so the way that we look at a fairy tale, the way we experience a fairy tale, it's almost with the the true energy of the feminine. And the feminine has a way of listening or observing with kind of a diffused, you know, not a crystal scientific measuring way of perceiving, but once. We say once upon a time. Everybody knows, like, chill, relax, listen with some other part of your being for the hints, for the stories, for the remembrances. Let it just work on you. They do have magic in them. And the thing about um, fairy tales is, you know, they're so cross-cultural, and yet these stories live again and again. Different details, but basic themes. So the fairy tale is um, what they're meant for is they help us relate to the human experience and the human soul. And the fairy tales concern with the greatest themes and motifs of human experiences and the quest for hidden treasures of that thought. Renewal of life, yes, let's rock that one. How to deal with envy and betrayal and opposites and transformation and union and happy ever after has always disturbed me a little bit, but actually, in a fairy tale, when it ends happily ever after, it's a code for integration. The person is whole, and when, once we have that wholeness, we are integrated, we can deal with the slings of arrows of outrageous fortune. So that's what that one means. And that's what we're here. We're going to explore all these possibilities. And for those of you that's been listening, and thank you very much for that. Uh, you know I move in and out and through and around. I weave. And, uh, but you, you get it. Okay. So we're going to work with uh, the, uh, the theme of Snow White. One of the themes, okay, is life that was almost lost. You can all relate to that, right? Where suddenly we wake up one day and go like, wow, I'm in the middle of my life. And we, we review. Or we look back. Or we regret. Or we get excited, okay? But uh, right now, Snow White's not exactly getting excited. So let's, let's set the plot. Uh, 
So, you know, feeling lost, this is a central issue that everyone who reflects on the feeling level can sense within themselves. It doesn't feel right. Sometimes there's these feelings as if we're dead or no feelings at all or life seems to stand still or life has passed one by or worse, you've never lived your authentic life but you've lived the life for others wanted you to or the unlived life of your parents. It's not always a doozy realizing that one. But there's always hope even in the last moment, whatever it is, that is the story of your life. So, and we love stories. We're humans. We're storytelling people. We are a culture of storytellers, okay? So, you see, the difference, and what I'm trying to gift my listeners with, is that we're all going to suffer. But the difference is to suffer consciously. That's the difference. Nobody's getting away with how suffering, because the suffering means growth. The suffering is like we think we know something when it's nice and cozy, and then uh, someone or an event comes in our life, and we're shaken. And uh, if we have a certain amount of maturity, we can deal with it. And if we don't, we fall apart, and then we go in search of the maturity. So it's all cool. That's what I mean by perfect. And people say, why? Because when people call me for appointments, it's like, just make all you need to do to make it perfect is leave your number. And that is all you need to do. Perfect actually means all of our parts, shadow and light. That's what it means. Okay. So we're going to start here. So once upon a time, in the middle of winter, snowflakes are falling like feathers from heaven. A queen was sitting at a window that had a frame of black ebony, and she was sewing. And as she sewed and she looked up at the snow, she pricked her finger with the needle, and three drops of blood fell in the snow. Because the red against the white snow looked so beautiful, she thought to herself, if only I had a child whose skin was as white as snow, whose cheeks and lips were as red as blood, and whose hair was as black as ebony would of the window frame. So afterwards, she gave birth to a daughter whose skin was as white as snow, Natch, whose cheeks and lips were as red as blood, but of course, and whose hair was as black as ebony. Absolutely. And thus she was called Snow White. But when the, when the child was born, the queen died. Wow. What a way to open up a story, a plot. What does this mean? This is huge these images. So let's go over them. So you, you know, because the way that we experience I, for, for there are so many different ways to interpret fairy tales and mythology. So this is not just the one way. It's the one that kind of fascinates me right now. You know, six months from now, I'll look at it completely different with some of the same things, but maybe different interpretations. It's kind of like a reading. You know, someone comes and I, I work with them and I see what's going on and tell the stories and because it's their living fairy tale and then we figure some things out and then they go away and six months later they come back and there's either a new story or, or the old story has resurfaced in another way. Ongoing creativity. So we never get, you know, there, so to speak. Otherwise, we'd be bored. Okay, so this winter tales, it's, it's about numb hearts. So it starts with, once upon a time, in the middle of winter, snowflakes were falling like feathers from heaven. So this begins, the story begins, we, we, we interpret dreams in very similar ways, okay? Or we interpret the, the language of psyche. Psyche is a poetess. It gives us symbols and images. And just like you read poetry, you also read your dreams or you read your fairy tales. You, you let it move through you. You are not going to understand this with a sharp mind and principles and laws because it will trick you. It will make a fool out of you every time, okay? So it begins in the middle of winter. What's the middle of winter? The solstice. So we already have a hint. That this is this is a story 
the, the code of this is about women's mysteries or the mystery of the feminine, which both in men and women, okay, because the man has an anima and he, he has an inner female, okay, so it's in the middle of winter, the solstice, when we go into the underworld. It's a great mystery. Okay. And that when something begins in the middle of winter, okay, within ourselves, it's cold. We don't have a lot of movement. Sometimes it's frozen or the feelings are frozen or our tears are frozen. Okay. So it begins in the middle of winter. It's cold and it's a gloomy time. But it's also the time of the winter solstice. It's the season we enter into the underworld. And it's the place of initiation. It's right there. The queen sits. Sewing to us. A task. A simple task. And has a fantasy. Now, the, there's, there's no indication here. The, the father shows up once in the entire story, the king. So the, this, is, this is when we have mostly women, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a feminine initiation, right? Okay. So the ice and the snow in the, uh, in, in the winter is, the, is rigid energy because we're, we're not able to survive without, some, without its opposite with the warmth and fire and protection of a warmness. So here again, we're dealing with opposites, fire and ice, warmth and cold. We always look for where the opposites are. That's where the tension of the story is. It begins to give us the emotional uh, weather, so to speak. What's going on here? The queen and the winter solstice, looking out a window. It's, it's a rather lonely image, kind of longing. I mean, if I saw a work of art of a queen looking out a window, I mean, my, my heart would go out to this. I also would get a little frightened that the pain of that kind of longing or the fantasies that would be in the queen and, of course, wherever there's a child, whether it be a dream, a myth, and fairy tale, we know it foretells a renewal. So there is so much in this first paragraph about this story, okay? Now, uh, and no, you know, no one can survive without warmth. And new life needs warmth. And Snow White uh, is, you know, she's motherless at birth. No mother. Gone. So the motherless child, and she is born in the dead of winter, and well, she's conceived in the dead of winter, and it's kind of like death and life and life and death. So we already know Snow White's got one hell of a coma or fate to work out here. She's really, this is astounding. She's conceived through fantasy and magic. She's born and disconnected to the earthly mother. So now we know this is uh, the triple goddess. She belongs to the great mother. The motherless child belongs to the great mother. And when we begin to recognize that, because very often uh, people that I know who get deeply involved in the devotions of the beloved feminine were motherless children. Because they actually belonged to the Great Mother. They didn't belong to their Earth Mother, no matter what it looks like. And then she, they find the Great Mother, whether it be Kali or the Black Madonna or the Blessed Virgin or Isis or any number of these marvelous images and archetypes. It already tells us that's what you have to go looking for. You're not going to find it in religion. I mean, you'll find it in religion to a degree. It's comforting, but the images in religion are masculine. They do not feed the feminine side of us. But also, you know, when there's this kind of coldness, 
So the motherless child, or when someone's reaction is like ice cold and we experience, you know, their, their glances and it's so chilling, you know, so we've got a lot of opposites going here. Birth, death, hot, cold, and in the middle, but also the middle of winter, it's a turning point. We go into the underworld. See, and that's why our ancestors celebrated the the, the solstice, and they they had you know the the lights uh, during the holy season, and our soul has a deep need, especially in the time of darkness, to see a new light, uh, at least symbolically. When we're wounded, when we're heartbroken, when we experience loss, when we experience betrayal which is always an experience to wake us up from our dangerous innocence. It's like, wake up. You weren't safe. You weren't ever safe. You didn't see it. Okay. So the birth of the divine child can be a symbolic experience, but it's also a premonition that things cannot and also must not continue as they are at the moment. So... One of the questions, you know, at that point in the story that I asked myself is, uh, but why do we stop short of making changes? We see, like, whoa, this is, this is not going to fare well. I need to make this change. I feel dead. Or I feel terrified. We need to make that little bit of a change, or at least imagine it. Perhaps. Or read a fairy tale. It always gives us hope. Okay. So, you know, another way of looking at, uh, you know, Snow White is, is also through uh, uh, the possibilities of, of uh, death and transformation, you know, because these fairy tales express these eternal patterns. And Snow White brings, the, uh, brings to light how the path of the sleeping soul is forged by the energy of desire. Now, of course... We've, we've left her. She's born. She's been manifested out of a fantasy. What does a child do in that kind of coldness? The father's not around. Uh, but when a, when a woman is a chief character in, in a story, it's, a, it's sign is, is the theme is from antiquity. The, the great mother of the goddess. It takes us back to a time when the world was ruled not by a god, but by a goddess. So once again, the story begins in the timelessness of the unconscious, in the season of death. Winter is the season. Remember, Persephone dwells in the underworld with Hades. She's the seven-year-old who's abducted, separated from her mother, and lives in the underworld. So, you know, we're, we're getting some... Getting some cousins, some kissing cousin stories over here. And uh, so Persephone resides in the underworld, leaving Demeter, her mother, above waiting for her return. So this is also about the ruling feminine principle. It's in a melancholy, unfulfilled state, separated from Earth by a layer of cold snow. Yet winter is the season that precedes the annual and renewal of spring. So, you know, that's what it is about fairy tales. Levels within, as my spiritual teacher used to say, cycles within cycles. And I would think, oh, my God, these cycles never end. I'll never get this. Okay, so the queen wishes for this child, uh, you know, the red, white, and blue. I mean, that's that's America. Sorry. Uh, For these colors, the white is snow and as red as blood and as black as ebony. Red, white, and black are the colors sacred to the great goddess. You got it. And black are the colors sacred to the great goddess. These colors represent her symbolic threefold nature, spring, summer, and winter, the maiden, the mother, the crone. So in some cases, you, you could look at it as Snow White, okay, the maiden, Demeter, the mother, and Hecate, the crone. Uh, and the wholeness embodied in the divine feminine trinity is encoded within the structure of the story. Pretty cool, right? The 
queen wishes for a child born in the mirror image of her current experience. Hmm. That always makes me nervous. Especially when children are conceived out of, out of uh, the mother feels empty. And it's like, wait, I got a great idea. I'll have a child. And that, that, actually, that's not such a great idea. Because it's already in that image, rather than in the fullness of your being, in the joy and the abundance. Um, or uh, a person is depressed. Okay. So perhaps, just perhaps, uh, this also can indicate a little bit of narcissism on the mother's part, okay, on the queen's part. Uh, you know, this may be her way, her attempt for the queen to overcome her melancholy. Because the queen hopes to find her life meaning through the birth of a child. Little does she know she's going to be taken out of the picture. Uh, and the child can carry the queen's feminine suffering for her. But it's why sewing that the queen is wounded. Very interesting. Because sewing is a very meditative and reflective task. It's also magical. You know, if you're sewing and you're saying prayers, that, that object actually becomes filled with magical prayers. Okay, so now we're going to go back, back to the snowflakes. They're falling like feathers from heaven. Snow, feathers, heaven. That's all the air element. Uh, snow, uh, each has a divine... Uh, and separate patter, no two alike, representing delicate feelings, uh, scarcely perceptible to the, to, uh, to the feelings, but they are hopeful. When we look at a snowflake, something will goes like, oh, I love that. In many instances, feathers symbolize positive conditions and delicate but practical. It can be a symbol of magic or intermediary from heaven. You know, when you make a wish on a feather and then you blow it off. It's also Hermes. And Hermes will carry the wind to fulfillment, which is also a cool thing. When the wind blows, put your prayers on the wind. They'll be answered. That's Hermes' job. And in the Egyptian myth, the goddess Mat weighs the soul against the weight of a feather. Okay, feathers are intense, man. In this story, the feathers indicate a hint. So often, it's a little small hint that seems insignificant. That the, the, the decisive, and they point the way. It's like, you know, I don't know why I followed that. I had a funny feeling. Okay? Because the insignificant that seemingly is powerless can overpower the most powerful. So many powerless acts have been demonstrated. Now, also the 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 because uh, I'm just thinking of this, uh, the red and the uh, the white and the black are also the colors of of alchemy. So you see, you can draw from many many different things about what these images. Okay, but this image so the snowflakes are falling like feathers from heaven. We already know. From heaven? Really? I think we are going to be experiencing some serious magic. Something is very different. And so the queen, and she's sitting at the window, and there's this frame of black ebony while she was sewing. So in Snow White, the, the king and the queen, they, they play a very important part in all of our psyches. Okay? Uh, they symbolize authority, the ruling principle, ordained by God, chosen, bearer, people depend on kings as gods, and psychological kings and queens represent the dominant opinions and principles of our personal life. Uh, the highest religions, political and scientific concepts, the rule to which we submit automatically, the guiding ideas which we, we live our lives by, the fundamental feelings that shape it. Now, this can be dangerous because part of individuation is, you know, figuring out 
who, who you are, what you say, what you're about. I mean, when somebody says, oh, my, my husband says, or my president says, or my accountant says, really, what do you say? Or my girlfriend says, really, well, what do you say? They haven't, they haven't formulated their own sovereignty, their, their own sense of self. So any, any question to why one is often told, like on principle, okay, so the, the, the king, the symbolism of the king and the queen <clears throat> is, you know, those are the principles we live by. But part of growth and development and consciousness is separating from the false principles. I mean, how often were you punished? On principle. Or are you like, I'm going to be cold and unforgiving on principle. No, you're just a cold witch is what you are, and you think it's principle. So you see how these tell us, you know, uh, moral and ethical ways of perceiving, but it's letting us know when it's a false king or queen, it's all about principles, it's not about relating, it's not about the heart. But like all archetypes, there is good and evil mother and father, king and queen. And in this fairy tale, and in many fairy tales, most fairy tales actually, the king or the queen often are old and feeble or about to die or doomed to death, which represents <coughs> the old order must die. And the hero or the heroine, that'd be you or me, uh, must be chosen and accept the unknown task of transformation. The old order must die. That was also what creates so much suffering. It's our resistance to the change. It's like, yeah, but that works. No, not really. It's familiar, but it's not working. But in Snow White, the masculine principle and the children are, they're not there. The vision of the future is absent. So we know she's got to go down into that underworld. We know her journey is jaw-dropping, cliff-hanging, terrifying, profound potential and wisdom is going to come out of this one. So the image of the lonely queen intensified that her life is cold and has become one-sided. And perhaps is, in, is, the, is an imprint of uh, a complex of inferiority or of meaninglessness, of a feeling of importance. Because complexes can rule one's life, just as collective norms and principles can. So the failure of one's cherished expectations can re reconform one's own gift of inferiority. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the queen told me I've got 90 seconds here. So we're going to wrap this one up, and we're going to continue with this for, for a good month because there's a lot in here. So part of what, you know, asking yourself this week, like what is it where I feel lonely and cold? Or, you know, you know what, what is going on in my life that I need to make these changes? Because we're all, you know, this is the season of going into the underworld. So while you're in there, you might as well be looking around and discovering that you're in the middle of a great, sacred, epic experience called your life. There is nothing ordinary about the ordinary. It's all extraordinary. So, till next week, au revoir.